Some cafe bar. Good morning. <coughs> Today we are very pleased to have a distinguished guest from the British Museum of Natural History, uh, Professor Richard Fordy. Professor Fordy is a, a fellow of the British Royal Society and he's been a, 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 a paleontologist at the Natural History Museum in London. He studied geology at the University of Cambridge and many of us know that he's a very famous paleontologist. And he's, uh, as, uh, his field is mainly on uh, autovision, trilobites, and graptolites. Uh, he's been uh, interested in uh, uh, the uh, uh, systematic evolution and uh, the mo modes of life. <coughs> Professor uh, uh, Fordy has published a lot uh, academically in, in research and, uh, papers. Also, as we all know, he's been uh, uh, published in many uh, uh, pub, uh, pub books on paleontology. His, uh, his, uh, uh, his book, Life, a history, a Natural History of the First Four Billion Years of Life on Earth, was uh, named by the New York Times in 1998 as one of the best books of the year. <coughs> and so he's uh, uh, not only a famous paleontologist, but a uh, famous science, uh, uh, science writer and a public communi communicator of science. <coughs> and we are so fortunate uh, to have him today to lecture for us. Uh, he will be here to, uh, to, do, to give four uh, lectures. Today, uh, two uh, lectures. In the first one will be entitled The Shape of Light of Evolution, and the second will be Cambrian evolutionary explosion. Uh, without wasting much time, let's welcome Professor Ford. Good morning, and um, thank you for uh, inviting me to come to Nanjing, uh, where I have many old friends. But first, can you all hear me? Can you all hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, these, the four lectures I'm giving are all quite general lectures uh, which I've given to uh, audiences including some specialists but also non-specialists over the last year or two. And I'm going to start uh, by talking about this man, uh, Charles Darwin, uh, and as you all know, last year was his 200th birthday and also the 150th celebration for the publication of The Origin of Species. Um, this statue of Darwin shows him as an old man uh, and it's in the Oxford University Museum. Uh, what I'm going to do is try and look at the shape of evolution as we have learned about it since the days of Charles Darwin. Uh, Darwin himself was an extraordinarily perceptive uh, um, scientist, as we all know. But at the time he was writing, there were many problems that had not yet been solved. So I'm going to look very briefly at the kind of things we have learned since Darwin's day to get a broad picture of how evolution has proceeded at the broadest level. Darwin famously said uh, that uh, the effects of evolution was like, he described it as a tangled bank of flowers with insects, earthworms, flowers, all collaborating together in a very complex ecosystem. This is what we would now call biodiversity. As a museum man, of course, I tend to think of biodiversity as a collection of specimens in, uh, in, in jars, lined rank upon rank in a 
very big collection. And you, working in another great museum, of course, will understand this concept of biodiversity. One of the problems Darwin had when he wrote the theory of evolution out in The Origin of Species was what he called, at the time, uh, the rarity or absence of intermediate forms. At the time he was writing, there were comparatively few uh, fossils that linked major groups of organisms. Um, this was for him a major stumbling block, a major difficulty with the widespread acceptance of the theory of evolution. Uh, the story of the last 150 years since the publication of The Origin has been a story of the discovery of many of these intermediate forms. Uh, sometimes, and this is why what I'm currently working on, a book about, quote, living fossils, sometimes these were just surprising discoveries among the living fauna. Uh, possibly the coelacanth fish comes to mind in this regard. But of course, with uh, increasing knowledge, we now know that the coelacanth fish is not in fact an intermediate between marine life or aqueous life and terrestrial life, but possibly this animal, the Australian lungfish, is closer <coughs> to a living form that provides a connection between two major life habits. And it's possible to see the history of life as a series of thresholds between one habitat and another. And the most crucial intermediate forms for which Darwin was looking were those that connected major parts of evolution, the sea and the land, or the land and the air. This story continues to get more interesting. The transition between water and land, for example, was augmented uh, perhaps 70 years after Darwin's book by the discovery of early terrestrial fossils in Greenland and elsewhere, showing uh, the early stages of the movement from water to land. But the stories are never finished. Uh, even then, the intermediates between a fish at the top and an early tetrapod land dweller at the bottom were not quite complete. For example, this is just looking at the bones that form the bones of the, of the hand um, and comparing that with a fin at the top. Uh, this was probably um, a, a picture of the intermediate steps a few years ago, but um, just uh, in the last few years, a fish called, uh, or a fish like <coughs> organism called Tiktaalik has been discovered. Uh, in the Arctic of Canada, which forms an almost perfect intermediary uh, between the uh, uh, water living animals and the terrestrial living animals. This was exactly the kind of intermediate form which Darwin would have been delighted to discover. At the time of his writing, nobody knew about Tiktaalik. And one of the um, interesting things about paleontology is that as we, can, as we go on collecting, uh, we find more and more of these intermediate forms. Now I know this is not a problem in China, but it is a problem in the UK, and it is particularly a problem in America, uh, where we still have people who are, as we describe them, creationists. Uh, they... Uh, believe in a very short time scale and that all life was created as individual species. Um, it's very important for paleontologists to continue to collect in the field to discover more and more of these intermediate forms. And I like to think that this is this Tiktaalik is one of the best recent examples that we have of an intermediate form linking two major life modes. Now once this threshold has been crossed from water to land, and you can repeat the story equally from, with regard to plants, then you are setting up a new ecosystem and there is the possibility <coughs> for new biological complexity. 
or the increase in overall biodiversity. And when you are considering the major patterns of evolution, it is this kind of threshold that I think is most important for increasing variety. Then, of course, I don't have to mention this here. Uh, the original, when I uh, first looked at the history of life myself, in the book that was mentioned by uh, your uh, um, director, the theory that birds and dinosaurs were, were related uh, was comparatively controversial. Now, thanks to discoveries in the People's Republic of China, I think almost everybody would agree that there is not just one intermediate form, but a whole variety of intermediate forms that bridge the gap between dinosaurs and birds. When I wrote my book, I said that feathers, for example, were a particular feature of birds. Um, history has now overtaken that. We now know that uh, the feather evolved before uh, and uh, the, what we would call a bird among dinosaurs, uh, and that it was secondarily recruited for flight, which is, of course, the ultimate characteristic of birds. So this is not just one series of intermediate forms, but a whole series of intermediate forms with varied developments of feathers. It's a wonderful, wonderful story, a triumph, of course, for Darwinian thinking. Um, there was a time when creationists would say to me, uh, ah, well, there is no intermediate between birds and any other animal. Well, now we have a whole series. So intermediate forms are one thing. Uh, another thing that puzzled Darwin enormously, and I'll talk more about this later, uh, was what he saw as the absence <coughs> of life in the Precambrian. Uh, when he was writing, this was a major puzzle. Already the major series of uh, thresholds that I described from water to land, from land to air, and so on, were known in the fossil record, but the Precambrian was simply a blank. And Darwin recognized this as a major stumbling block in his theory, and he speculated on it for the reasons for it at some length. Mostly, he said it was because of imperfections in the fossil record. He thought that the Precambrian uh, period was uh, devoid of fossils because the fossil record was so imperfect. Already, of course, at that time, fossils of stromatolites, and I've just seen the best specimen of stromatolites I've ever seen at the entrance to your institute here, just by the doorway, um, <coughs> were known from Precambrian rock, and some people had recognized their organic nature. <coughs> what they had not done, of course, was look for fossils at the small scale, nor widely explored late Precambrian strata around the world. So one of the other great things that's happened between Darwin's time and today is the filling out of that Precambrian record. And, of course, the discovery of living analogies uh, to some of these early stromatolite communities. Most of you will know that this, is, of course, is Shark Bay in Western Australia, where uh, a beautiful, this is a photograph uh, we took uh, a couple of years ago in this famous locality. Um, I'm, I'm currently visiting many of these very famous uh, living fossils, if you like, around the world. Uh, where beautiful examples of um, uh, stromatolites can still be seen uh, growing today under very special conditions <coughs> which are, resemble somewhat the conditions which were widespread in the Precambrian, particularly the absence of grazers and things which might destroy these laminated algal and bacterial growths. Then, of course, Darwin did not look down at the small size scale. Uh, what you needed to do was to appreciate that Precambrian life was going to be of the order of microns, uh, not 
generally the actual fossil, not generally the large sort of thing you could hold in your hand. But of course we now know that even that, uh, uh, even some of these primitive thread-like organisms are um, uh, still with us today and very, very similar to things which were probably around in the Precambrian. Now Darwin's idea of evolution, of course, was concerned with organismic evolution. And I think what we've also done in the last 150 years is broaden that concept to the idea of planetary evolution in conjunction with biology. So I think probably the most important change in mindset is the idea that the Earth itself has, in, has evolved in conjunction with life. And specifically, of course, in this case, that the blue-green uh, algae or, or cyanobacteria and their relatives actually transformed the Earth's atmosphere and made subsequent evolution of animal life possible. Um, I don't think Darwin would have had much concept of the primeval uh, world, nor of its transformation, thanks to the activities of organisms themselves. So, uh, although it's sometimes popularized by the idea of Gaia, uh, I think everybody now accepts in the geological and paleontological world that the Earth is a system with life and the Earth interacting. Life and the Earth evolve together. The appearance of cells with nuclei, and now a whole range of um, <coughs> Precambrian uh, bacteria uh, among the living forms. This is a, 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 you can't read the details, it doesn't matter. Uh, the ones I've asterisked, this is from quite a recent paper by Andy Knoll, um, are forms which have some, among the living bacteria and their relatives, which have some representative in the fossil record now in the Precambrian. And as you see, there are quite a range. So this is a measure of how much our knowledge of the Precambrian natural <coughs> record has improved. Oops. That's one of these problematic slides. Then of course, uh, we are approaching the uh, upper part of the Precambrian, uh, where a much greater variety of organisms is now known than was known uh, at the time of Charles Darwin, or indeed for many years afterwards. Uh, I needn't mention to you here in this audience that the discovered in China, but also uh, in Lake Precambrian, we have these Ediacaran faunas, which are now well known virtually worldwide with a variety of organisms. None of this was known to Charles Darwin. Uh, all of it is uh, uh, relevant to the story of the evolution of the Earth as a whole. At the end of the Precambrian, more than uh, about 600 million years and after, a, a, a wide variety now of Ediacaran animals known, soft-bodied, uh, none of them have hard parts, all of them are slightly mysterious as far as their biological interpretation is concerned, and my second lecture I will come back to this in more detail. Um, but it is perfectly clear that after a long period of several billion years of, of increase in variety at a small cellular level, the appearance of mesozoan is followed by an increase in size. First of all, among soft-bodied diacrid animals, and then uh, in the Cambrian by organisms having skeletons. Now that was the point at which Darwin cut in. He knew about the organisms with skeletons that appeared at the base of the Cambrian, but he didn't know about any of these precursor events. And that, I think, has probably been the transformation, the biggest transformation since the time of, of Darwin in our understanding of the Earth as a whole, which, of course, is combined with knowledge of the time scale over which this was happening. Darwin had no real concept. He knew it was vastly long, but he did not know the magnitude of geological time. Now this is hung into a time scale. We have a much more accurate position uh, idea about the transformation of the Earth in time scale. So from an abiotic Earth, we have increasing oxygen thanks to the long era of stromatolites and their relatives. 
we have an increase in size of organisms, we have increasing ecological complexity uh, by the time we arrive uh, at the Cambrian. Um, some of these Ediacaran faunas are quite spectacular, but the more I look at them, this is practically life size here, one of the ones from Namibia. Uh, the more I look at them, the more I think that they are not, they do not include things that we can recognize as ancestors of known fire. That's another question. So we arrive at the Cambrian, and the next threshold in the history of life, which was known to Darwin, which is the appearance of organisms having hard parts, exoskeletons, uh, calcified cuticles. So I think this is a very, very important threshold. Many people would say the most important threshold in the history of life, and certainly transforms uh, the um, <coughs> and certainly transforms our understanding of the fossil record thereafter because the number of fossils and fauna increased enormously. Now this is where, of course, I don't have to emphasize the importance <coughs> of Chinese discoveries. Uh, we're used to thinking of the Burgess Shale, and again I'll come back to this, but of course the number of, of wonderful things that you have found here in the Chenjiang fauna and its related fauna have served more to transform our understanding of what happened in the Cambrian uh, than almost anything else. Um, I just put a few in, before I'll show more about uh, these later on. What is evident, of course, is that right from the base of the Cambrian, there are a variety of organisms which we can fit into known phyla. Uh, arthropods, in particular, are enormously diverse, uh, not from the very base of the Cambrian, but from uh, the, the time of the Chen fauna and later. <coughs> Uh, this has very interesting implications for the way evolution proceeds, um, which I will develop in my second lecture. And of course, at this time, my old friend uh, that I have spent most of my life studying, the trilobites appear. Now, it's important to say at this point that when Darwin was working, he would have taken the trilobite as the ancestral arthropod, because at the time, it was virtually the only arthropod that was known from the earliest Cambrian strata. So his idea of a, of a primitive arthropod was a trilobite. Something else that we have seen, notably from discoveries like the Burgess Shale and Chen Zhang, is that the arthropods, far from being just trilobites, <coughs> with their skeletons, hard exoskeletons during the Cambrian, were just one of many arthropods which immediately poses interesting questions about what was happening earlier on, which I shall develop in my second lecture. But the fact remains that trilobites, having a nice calcified cuticle, um, are uh, still the commonest fossils to be found in Cambrian strata the world over. Um, and the acquisition of those cuticles is certainly an important threshold through which life crossed simultaneously many groups. Brachiopods, of course, as uh, Professor Rob will know, uh, and many other animals besides acquired these hard exoskeletons. Now many people think that that was the most important threshold uh, that controlled subsequent uh, animal evolution. There are other ideas around. Trilobites, of course, had very well developed eyes, here and here, and there is at least one theory that maintains that the appearance of eyes through visual systems was the threshold which drove subsequent animal evolution. After all, if you can see well, you can hunt, so it's possible to be an efficient predator, uh, and if you have an efficient predator, then it is necessary to evolve defenses against predators, which um, starts the kind of evolution arms race, as we call it, do you understand that term? Uh, I invent a good weapon, you must invent a good defense. I invent another weapon, you invent a better defense. Uh, this sort of arms race is not possible until you have these kind of complex sensory systems, which were certainly in place by Cambrian times. So I think it is possible to look at that as one of the great thresholds through which life passed to increase biodiversity. 
but of course all of this is still is happening music, thank you uh, is still happening in the marine realm um, more of these wonderful things but uh, uh, one of the other characteristics of the Cambrian of course was that there was more variety in certain groups which are now rather obscure then than there is now Darwin would have loved to know this uh, Lobopov uh, being a prime example one of the things I did last time I was down on your side of the world was go and look for um, uh, Periphetus a uh, survivor from this very early age of evolution there it is then there are new discoveries these are still being made uh, and this is one of the best things about paleontology and Darwin would have loved it uh, these, this brightly coloured animal uh, is from the Silurian and my friend Derek Siviter and I are studying these things from the Silurian of Shropshire there is a tendency for people to think that all innovation kind of happened immediately and fast in the Cambrian uh, and it was certainly true that that was a major period of innovation but partly it is the fossil record as Darwin said there are very few soft-bodied faunas for example between the Cambrian uh, and the Lake Devonian uh, and this Silurian fauna which I'll show a few more from is one that fills the gap and it's been full of surprises so although we know much more thank goodness otherwise we'd be out of a job uh, there is still much more to discover now of course Darwin quite famously in the origin of species <coughs> mentioned human beings very briefly um, there's <coughs> oh thank you <laughs> there was a good reason for this um, of course while most people or while many people of, uh, of his contemporaries could accept the idea of um, a, a, a evolution from one animal to another taking that next step of believing that human beings themselves had evolved from something that wasn't human was very difficult for his contemporaries to accept although some of them were quick to do so uh, there is a misconception incidentally uh, that which has been beautifully shown by historians of science that the story of Darwin was one of Darwin on the one side and the church on the other side uh, that's, an, uh, that's qu quite a simplification uh, in fact some members of the clergy some religious people uh, were very quick to accept Darwinian ideas um, they were in, at that time in Britain and throughout Europe many of the most educated people were actually uh, part of the relig religious classes and only some of the church were very anti-Darwinian and some of them were quite pro-Darwinian so that's, a, that's an aside um, what of course people were looking for was an intermediate uh, between broadly the apes and humans and at Darwin's time that was completely unknown although something of early human history was known mostly from artifacts from tools um, and originally the idea was rather naive and I think probably Darwin's ideas of intermediate forms were slightly naive in which you have a straight line as it were between an ape on the one hand and a human on the other with a missing link uh, in between now one of the great things that's happened over the last 150 years is fleshing out the story of human evolution and of course it's not a question of just one intermediary but a host of intermediaries many many specimens many many species a few great discoveries like this one of the Australopithecus <coughs> Lucy uh, have characterized the story and made it absolutely clear that man's origin is in Africa uh, and that there are many um, uh, uh, early hominids in Africa 
which are not directly on the line that leads to Homo sapiens himself. <coughs> Very hard to put this in one summary slide, but I got this one out of science, which shows some uh, idea of the number of species now involved in the hominid line. And I'm not going to go into any of the details, of course, today. Uh, but that's one of, that was the tree current at the time, and it's always changing. The point is that Darwin's concept of uh, an intermediate form has now been replaced by a mass of intermediates and side branches, and that this, the more people study it, is characteristic of the evolutionary tree as a whole. Now, if you want to regard this as another threshold, <coughs> the appearance of intelligence, ourselves, uh, then um, I think there's some justice in that. Uh, it is yet another uh, threshold that was passed through that altered the rules of evolution and the way inter animals could interact with their environment and with one another. So one only has to look at, first of all, the sheer numbers of humans, which of course is a problem, uh, and the fact that they can live anywhere in the world to appreciate the difference that intelligence has made to the biosphere. And, of course, the good thing about paleontology, always has been, always will be, I hope, is that surprises still happen. Um, this is uh, a, a, a little hominid that was described in the Indonesian island of Flores. It only stood about that high. Uh, which turned up just a couple of years ago uh, and uh, it's now called Homo floridiensis, uh, completely unexpected. Uh, most people that I, or most anthropologists I know, now think that Homo floridiensis uh, was um, derived not from the, the out of Africa humans, but from a much earlier uh, event, possibly even of Homo habilis or Homo erectus. Uh, <coughs> The latest word is probably Homo habilis. Uh, so the out of Africa story itself is becoming a multiple story, not just one invasion of, well, of modern humans to the rest of the world. It was already known that Homo erectus had come out of Africa. It seems it may, might have happened a number of times. And that is one of the stories of paleontology, that the more you study, the more you find, and usually the more complicated the stories become. But I don't think any of them are inconsistent uh, with the theory of evolution. As somebody once famously remarked, how would you disprove the idea of evolution? The answer is, if you can show me a mammal uh, in the Cambrian. Well, um, the evidence of evolution in the broad sense is what I've described now, up to now. That is, evolution across major thresholds. We've seen what is it to land. Um, we've seen what happened through the Precambrian to change the whole shape of the world. Uh, we've seen uh, land into air and birds. There are many other examples I could have quoted for that, of course. Uh, and then we've seen such things as the evolution of uh, intelligence in humans. One of the things that's perhaps understudied these days is what one might call microevolution in paleontology, uh, where are investigated species to species changes in fossil organisms. Uh, this group, the grand sweep, the grand design, is quite clear, uh, but fewer people these days are studying organisms, maybe this is not true in China, but uh, are studying organisms like ammonites, which have a superb stratigraphical record from which you can actually deduce the nature of changes uh, from one species to another. It seems to me, most of you are younger, much younger than me, uh, the controversy over uh, um, uh, punctuated equilibrium, uh, which belongs several decades ago, was one of the last times that people really looked in detail at what was happening at a species level with vast collections in the proper record. And uh, probably only uh, now, and possibly due to the importance of climate studies, uh, are the foraminifera 
used for this kind of, of uh, very, very detailed studies, largely because you can get such a large sample, and indeed spore studies sometimes too, but they're partial organism studies. Uh, this is slide is here to rem remind me another thing that Darwin didn't really emphasize in the origin of species, extinction. He knew about it. In fact, John Phillips, Chris Hill and I were mentioned John Phillips earlier, had already recognized that the history of life was punctuated by major extinction events. Uh, I suppose Darwin played them down slightly, although he had to have extinction in order to get evolution. Uh, but the idea of mass extinction, which has been studied very, very intently over the last decade, uh, is something that's really uh, achieved prominence in the 20th and perhaps 21st centuries. The dodo, of course, being the prime, the perfect example of man-made extinction. Probably one of the most famous curves in paleontology is this one, which shows the rise of life in Cambrian, punctuated by these major extinction <coughs> events. Uh, the KT boundary here, extinction of the dinosaur, and the Permian extinction, which has been extensively studied by people in this institution, uh, being prime examples. These are times when the history of life was reset, when all the thresholds that I've talked about were not altered. That is, we never got to the point where we exterminated to the point where organisms had to retreat back to the sea, for example, at the end of the Thermian, although it came quite close to it in some way. Um, so the, the, it did not affect the threshold of, of evolution, but it did affect major groups and removed one set of major groups, which were then replaced by another. So, um, everybody knows about this one, the extinction of the, of the uh, dinosaur. Many people think that this was the result of uh, a meteoritic or major impact. Uh, other people <coughs> disagree, but nobody would dispute that this reset some parts of the biosphere. Uh, the, the dominant reptile disappeared and it gave a chance, an opportunity to the replacement of the same eco, uh, the same ecological roles by large mammals. So the ecology, if you like, remained somewhat similar before and after the event, uh, but were repopulated by different organisms. But it's equally important to remember that other organisms survived. We cannot have a bird-dinosaur theory without dinosaur birds coming through that mass extinction event. Um, so survival is also an extraordinarily important fact. Um, again, Darwin didn't know much about the Permian Triassic, when much of the ocean uh, became anoxic, uh, the supercontinent, oh, there's also, oh, there's also um, there's there. and again, some people think that this was a result of major evolution, a uh, major eruption of the Siberian traps. Other people disagree. It doesn't matter. What does matter is that the, the, the form of the ocean was reset before and after the extinction. Uh, something that Darwin knew about as a fact, but it had no reason to, for cause. And to, to this, I suppose, list, we have to add <coughs> another one more recently. I don't have a slide to illustrate it. The snowball earth, uh, at the <coughs> end, uh, or late in the Precambrian, where the globe is supposed to have frozen practically from one end to the other, and only <coughs> organisms that could survive that crisis <coughs> could pass through to give subsequent evolution. So, how do we put this together? Um, I don't think anybody could doubt, and Darwin would have appreciated, uh, the major threshold of evolution that I've talked about. Increase, overall increase in diversity, overall increase in complexity of organisms, the conquest of new habitats. Ocean to land, uh, land to air, all of this results in a permanent increase in overall biodiversity. But superimposed on that is another pattern, which I would call uh, iterative evolution, or emergent evolution, if you prefer, which is the constant reappearance of particular habitats uh, and morphotypes 
in response to similar life habits. This happens in the sea and it happens on land. Uh, the punctuation, the major punctuation between these is provided by the mass extinction events. Now one of the best examples is probably provided by reefs or the reef uh, system, uh, which everybody knows is extremely biodiverse and extremely widespread at the present day. Um, this is just a, a nice photograph of a, of a coral reef. Uh, I'm modern one with Fridac here, the giant clam and various nice brightly coloured algae and so on around it. Now the reef system requires light and it requires a frame building organism uh, and when the frame is built other organisms um, acquire habitat and ecological niches within the frame. More and more organisms are recruited and you finish up with an enormously biodiverse system rather which has been famously compared to a tropical rainforest. It seems that if you have the right marine conditions, right from the start, an organism or organisms would tend to build up a reef. If you want to put it another way, if you've got a frame building organism, reefs are an emergent property of evolution. Um, this is an extremely ancient example, uh, which is from Namibia, uh, and kindly uh, supplied uh, by um, uh, Rachel Wood to me. This is probably the earliest reef type organism, um, and uh, it's people are not even sure what kind of organism it is, but it does build very positive frames in late Precambrian prior to the Cambrian evolutionary explosion. So it's there right from the, foot, right from the first. Um, in, the, in the lower Cambrian, you get frames built by archaeocyathids, <coughs> which some people think are sponges, uh, other people don't think they're sponges. <coughs> but that's already there in the lower Cambrian, and within these archaeocyathid reefs there are cavities, and within the cavities there are already organisms which are forming uh, um, cavity communities in a biodiverse system. Um, by the time you arrive at the Silurian, you've got something that everybody would recognise as a coral reef, uh, with things like um, uh, massive corals, branching corals, and crinoids, and nautiloids, and so on. Uh, and my friends, the trial about tucked in there somewhere, not the bracket bog. Um, now this is recognisably a reef, but almost every organism on that reef is not directly related to something living today. Um, or not closely related, anyway. The corals, for example, belong to a completely different group. Uh, Nautiloids, perhaps, are still with us, but they're very insignificant. The arthropods are different. A few brachiopods survive, but not on reefs. Um, so this ecosystem is a way of making a, a structure, really, a species-rich structure, uh, which emerges, I won't say automatically, but uh, is um, the way ecosystems repeatedly organize themselves, uh, given the right conditions. Uh, here we are, arriving somewhere in the Lake area, the lake in Morocco, I think. Um, here we are in the Permian with a, a, um, a, a reef composed of, of, of briar zones, courtesy of Paul Taylor, but you can see the cavities, whoops. There's a reconstruction of it. Uh, these are different sponges, briar zones, and again, you'll see cavities with inside with creating other ecological opportunities. Uh, by the time you arrive at the uh, Cretaceous, I was getting into trouble with my friend Peter Skelton. Uh, you can get reefs built by rudists, uh, or after the Permian Triassic, you can get reefs built by uh, modern uh, um, types of corals, uh, with other organisms occupying the same ecological niches and very often assuming the same form uh, as things in the Paleozoic. Uh, so after the Permian Triassic extinction event, there was a short period where there were no reefs and then they reappeared, but this time with different 
cast of characters building. So the point is, I think, that this is a different kind of evolution. Uh, on the one hand, we have evolution across thresholds, which produces innovations which are continuous and unchanging and pass through all the extinction events. And on the other hand, we have a kind of evolution where the extinction event removes temporarily an ecosystem, which then re-evolves with often from a different origin with different organisms, but looking very, very similar uh, in subsequent periods of time. And I think if you're going to look at the major patterns of evolution, it's an interaction between these thresholds and the repeated kind of uh, appearance of uh, ecological types, uh, which accounts for a way of understanding modern uh, biodiversity. And that brings us, of course, back to a modern coral reef. One could repeat the story. <coughs> and I won't in much detail, uh, for, say, the forest ecosystem. And this just happens to be a, a picture I took in uh, New Zealand of a nice <coughs> forest. Um, but this is a picture I've taken not far from my hometown in England, uh, where you will see nice tall trees, and you'll see an understory, and if we looked in the soil, we would find a, a community of decomposing organisms, the fungi, uh, mites, uh, Springtails, small organisms mostly, annelid worms, that break down the leaf litter. Now that structure uh, appeared very, very soon in the fossil record after uh, tissue, the evolution of tissues sufficient to support plants uh, uh, to uh, produce a canopy. Uh, and thereafter, in spite of the great crises of life, the great extinction events, which removed, temporarily removed forests. When forests re-evolve, if I can put it like that, they tend to evolve towards the same structure. <coughs> now some of these organisms have gone through all the extinction events. One of the surprises is that if you filtered, uh, if you look at the forest floor, and you take the small organisms living in the forest floor, in the leaf litter, and in the top part of the soil, there is an assemblage recently discovered as old as late Silurian, earliest Devonian, in which some of the same organisms are still present. So that particular ecosystem has come all the way through the subsequent mass extinction events, because presumably <coughs> the habitat which they needed was present somewhere all the time. So, uh, if I can put it very simply, organisms only disappear if there is a crisis which removes their habitat entirely. Otherwise, they will come through. So all the trees here um, are things that have evolved since the uh, KT Valley, since the extinction of the dinosaur. Without exception in the UK, though here in China you have a few long survivors like Ginkgo, which I've just been to see. Um, however, things below here, ferns, and some of the forest floor inhabitants are things which have actually come through several mass extinctions. But the structure of the forest has uh, evolved and re-evolved several times after the mass extinction. So my summary would be that you can understand evolution as a, an interplay between major thresholds and major innovations, which once they have happened are never lost, and extinction events which punctuate the fossil record, uh, which allow for new organisms to move in and replay what has happened in the past. The re-evolution of reefs, <coughs> the reappearance of forests, <coughs> and you can find many other examples. Oh, uh, that's just a, one of the columns from the Natural History Museum uh, in London. Uh, you'll remember this, those of you who've been there. Uh, somebody pointed out to me that this column uh, was based on a particular species of carboniferous tree bark uh, used as ornament in, the, in, the, in our museum. Oh, that's a, and there's a reconstruction to make the point of uh, a nice old 
painting of the of a, of a carboniferous swamp with different sorts of trees, but nonetheless making a canopy, an understory, and here deep composers. Um, finally, um, and rather difficult to talk about this one, uh, if you like, Darwin often used the language of advancement in his work. And he would, he would say uh, that something was advanced or evolved or more evolved and so on, which implies direction. And what I talked about is, I think, a mixture of direction and repetition. Uh, so, I think it is quite right to talk about direction and correct to talk about direction from those first single cells and stromatolites up through multicellular organisms to the Cambrian, up onto land, up into the air, uh, and so on. I think that is a direction. At the same time, we have iteration, like the reappearance of reefs through geological time, or the reappearance of forests through geological time. So that, that's iteration. Which means, uh, what do you do about human consciousness? Uh, and so I, I'm using, uh, of course, oops, I'm using this man as the example, the prime example of the top of human consciousness. Uh, brain, uh, our own intellectual ability. Is that a threshold like the ones I've been describing? Uh, that takes us from land, uh, from sea to land, for example. Is the appearance of consciousness another thing on that upward line of innovation? Something Darwin would have called an advancement. Some people think it is. In fact, one of my colleagues uh, thinks that it's kind of inevitable. But if we just leave any, supposing humans hadn't evolved, uh, some other organism would have evolved which would, would have become conscious in our sense because it's another threshold which life would have taken and it's a very difficult answer to, uh, to question to answer and one I've given some thought to and I don't have a satisfactory answer um, it would be foolish to say I think that there hasn't been a general increase in complexity neural complexity uh, through, say, the Phanerozoic. I, if I can put it simply, I think a mammalian world is probably a smarter world than an amphibian world, by and large. Probably due to the arms race I talked about earlier. If you get smarter as a hunter, you've got to be smarter as, a, as the hunted. And this will tend to rack things up. But does that necessarily involve human consciousness? Will that automatically lead to uh, the development of the conscious mind. It, um, well, this is where I get an excuse to show trilobites. Um, this looks like a fairly ordinary trilobite from the top. But uh, uh, it has most peculiar eye. Um, the trilobite eye is a, is a special <coughs> organ that was made of biconvex lenses here, made of calcium carbonate. Now the point about the trilobite eye is it is, as far as I know, unique in uh, the history of life. No other organism, no other <coughs> arthropod, has managed to use calcium carbonate, calcite, as the medium for sight. Trilobite is unique. Um, or let's take gratolites, which I've mentioned earlier, which I've studied for some years. Uh, gratolites are, or were, colonial organisms, marine organisms, very successful, uh, with a, um, an organic skeleton and very highly organized colonies. And as far as I know, these are unlike reefs or any of the other things I've been talking about, have never reappeared. Nothing resembling this tuning fork rattlite that I know about has reappeared in subsequent evolution. The point is there are some 
innovations in evolution which happen once and once only. Uh, trial by eyes, uh, highly organized colonial organisms like Grapsalites. <coughs> so the question you're left with is, is human consciousness uh, one of the inevitable steps in evolution, the increases in complexity, uh, the thresholds that have to be crossed, or is it a one-off? Is it a peculiarity of one particular species at one particular time? Um, let us say a particular bipedal ape in Africa which found that better community organization and the development of speech um, would allow it to escape predators and be a more efficient hunter. Now, I don't know what the answer to that is. In fact, I don't think there is an answer to it, because short of us dying out and waiting to see whether a porpoise or uh, some other kind of mammal evolved <coughs> intelligence, there is absolutely no way of testing it. In other words, this makes it something of a non-scientific question. But it's one that, at least in the UK, has been attracting a certain amount of attention. So, um, just to finish on a, a, a current note, uh, I mentioned what intelligence has done for us is to increase our numbers. Uh, we all know that as our numbers increase, we all require energy, uh, and this is one of these projections for requirements and supply of energy, which I think is a fairly respectable one, of what we need in the next century. As our numbers increase, uh, of course there is less space for all that wonderful <coughs> biodiversity that has been produced by 4, 000, nearly 4,000 million years of evolution. So any talk like this should certainly finish up with a plea for the right of organisms uh, like this wonderful range of beetles uh, to um, carry on their wonderfully biodiverse existence uh, in spite of the increase in the numbers of us human beings. So, thank you for that. And that's the end of the talk. Very interesting talk. That's about as general as you can make it. Right, we have, <laughs> but, uh, but we have traveled uh, a long way to the Zulu City.